Today on Quest, I have Annie Jubb. She's a pioneer in bio-based nutrition and the use of food as a natural medicine. She's widely recognized as a world authority on detoxifying the body and cell rejuvenation. Join us today on Quest. Life is a quest for logic and reason. It is a quest to find balance between science and faith. Life is a quest for knowledge and understanding. But most importantly, it's a quest for personal discovery. Whatever your quest, knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. Welcome to Quest. Hello everyone, I'm your host, Todd Fisher, and this is Quest. For those of you that might be new listeners, let me tell you a little about me. I'm the founder of Metatomics and the author of the best-selling book, Metatomics, The Grand Design. I'm a philosopher, a theorist, a metaphysicist. I'm a perpetual pupil of theology, and I'm an expert in comparative religious study. I've also extensively researched the mind-body connection anatomy, and physiology. I documented over 300 case studies while researching my book, all from a scientific perspective, with cases that ranged from near-death and out-of-body experiences to possession to past life experiences, as well as the metaphysical, the paranormal, and other unexplained cases of a spiritual nature. This podcast will bring you some of those astonishing stories, and in some cases by the people that actually lived them. From time to time, I'll be talking about important, perhaps even controversial issues from both spiritual and scientific points of view. The world we live in is ever-changing, and there's often a conflict between spirituality and science, and I wanted to bring you this podcast to balance that equation. It will show you how we know what we know, and there's still so much we don't know. For me, Curiosity is part of what makes us human. It's the joy of discovery. It's what drives us. It's our quest. Today's podcast is a little bit different than the previous episodes that have aired. I've told you before that I am airing these out of order. This one is a newer podcast, though, and whereas... Most of the interviews that I've done up to now have been, you know, interviews or source materials or other, um, other, other people and things that are related to supporting the book Metatomics, the Grand Design, because as I've said before, the original manuscript was over a thousand pages and I had to get that cut down around 500 pages to release it as a book. So a lot of things had to come out. Many of the case studies, uh, different interviews with religious scholars, different experts in, in all different types of fields, all cut out. So what I wanted to do was create the Quest podcast to be able to bring those people back and reintroduce the data that's missing from the book, um, which I thought would be interesting, especially hearing it you know, from them directly and not just sort of transcribing their interviews into book form. But where I'm at now is I am writing the next book, Advanced Metatomics. And Advanced Metatomics is much different than than the first Metatomics book, mainly because the original book is a big story. It's God's grand design. It's this big plan. And I wanted people to see what I think that my theory behind what this plan was and is. The next book, however, Advanced Metatomics, is more personal. It's more about the individual. And uh, and I talk about this a little bit in the interview, uh, toward the end of the interview today. But what I'm getting into is really for, for us to be able to save the world, we have to save ourselves first. And to do that, we have to get ourselves in this, in this new stage of a physiological attunement. And that is a physical attunement and a mental attunement. Because these things have to operate together for you to really, truly understand the power that you have within yourself. And what I talk about in the new book 
is that there is an operator and the operator is controlling a mechanism. The operator is the soul. It's inhabiting this body, which is a mechanism. And this mechanism is here to protect, protect you. It's here to protect the soul. It's here to protect the operator. And the two are supposed to work in harmony. And unfortunately today, I think a lot of people aren't functioning with this, with this head body duality. There's, this work isn't happening. And it's, it's for many reasons. And this next book will touch on that. And what I wanted to do today was to bring on Annie Jubb, who uh, is brilliant when it comes to nutrition and matters of the body. And, uh, and I wanted her to kind of just talk about just the beginnings of some of the things, just the slightest little bits of what will go into the next book. And, uh, and I really like what she has to say, because as a consumer myself, I always try to look at things from a consumer perspective when I can. I don't really know a lot about food and nutrition. I'm not really a foodie. I don't like really take in an incredible dining experience. I'm more of kind of a gas and go type guy. I just want to get food for fuel and move on. But now that I'm getting older, I'm thinking I probably should be watching what I'm putting, the quality of the fuel that I'm putting in, in the mechanism. And I wanted her to kind of give me a crash course today uh, about nutrition. And I think she did that, uh, did that great today because I like to bring guests on the podcast that I can learn from too. I don't just want you, the listener, to learn, but I want to also learn things. So I want to always know things I don't know. So today I have Annie Jubb. Annie is known to her clients as a teacher, a healer, a spiritual leader. She's an amazing speaker and an expert in the mind-body connection. I think you'll really enjoy the deep dive we got into today about nutrition and the body. Enjoy. I'd like to welcome to the podcast, Annie Jubb. Hi, Annie. How are you? Hi. Hi, Todd. I'm great. How are you doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. I'm happy to have you as a guest on Quest. Mm. Oh, well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> I wanted to have you introduce yourself to the okay. listening audience because you have done so much. I didn't know where to start, where how to even begin to talk about your career. So you have written books, you've had restaurants, you've had health food stores, you've had a show on YouTube, you've done like a ton of stuff. Give everyone the rundown, what your career has been like up to now, the high point of your career, talking to Todd Fisher on Quest, obviously, but go back before that. And let's talk about all the buildup <laughs> that happens to go to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, I'm the, in a nutshell, I have a program that I put together um, in 1990, it's about 30 years now, that I call Life Food Nutrition. So life, life food nutrition. And basically what it is, is looking at the highest vibrational frequencies that we can intake through the food that we eat, right? So basically it's very simple. It's raw organic living foods, you know, uh, biodynamic if possible. But basically just eating a lot of fresh raw fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, herbs from the herbal kingdom, some fermented foods with a real eye on the microbiome. Now the microbiome is becoming very popular, which is great. I've been beating that drum for a long time now, and it's good to see that come up. So really, how do we heal ourselves with the tools that we have available to us today? And when I started this, actually, I, um, <clears throat> I realized that there was just a huge gap in the nutrition that we had had when I was a child to what was happening like in 1990. And I looked around, and I thought, well, you know, all these people have diabetes and obesity and you know, AIDS was just coming up. So there was a lot of viruses and Epstein-Barr and all these kind of unusual little viruses that were starting to, to uh, emerge. And I thought, well, what's always been good? You know, we've always eaten fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds. If we eat them in season, they even have a higher vibrational frequency. I found a beautiful camera that's called a curling camera that takes a photograph of the aura around any living thing. So a fruit or vegetable, another seed, of course, but humans, trees, any plant, anything that's alive has a measurable and beautiful organically, you know, colorful energy field around them. And, um, and when you can photograph it, you can look at it. So, you know, take an orange, for example, it has this lightning storm of electricity around it. It's very visual. If you look at like, you know, even with um, uh, different kinds of, um, 
EEG and things like that, where you can measure the vibrational frequency around something. But it's kind of cool when you can look at it, right? So the Curlian photographs allow us to look at that. And then when you cook the orange or you denature it significantly, uh, the light or that vibrational frequency around it dissipates quite dramatically. And so do the vitamins and minerals and the enzymes inside of the food. So with Raw Living Foods in, in my program, Life Food Nutrition, we look a lot at the enzymes. So the enzymes have a survival temperature of about 118 degrees Fahrenheit, 46 Celsius. And when we cook it above that, the enzymes die and the enzymes digest that food for us. So when we eat a lot of cooked foods, lots of denatured foods, you know, certainly there, there's stores that are just filled with aisle after aisle after aisle of packaged and denatured foods. When we fill ourselves up with that food, um, it lowers our vibrational frequency because it takes, or it costs something actually to digest that food. So my work is really looking at how do we, how do we recover the body? How do we recover our health? Even when somebody is, you know, really quite ill, you know, I, I sort of, um, I opened up a, my own uh, outpatient fasting clinic in New York City during the 90s for about 10 years. And I ran a lecture series and we educated a lot of people and um, a lot of post-op cancer patients came to me. Now at that time, cancer was a death sentence. There were very few that were escaping that death sentence. And so here was this big you know, population of people that were coming to me and we started nutritional fasting them, which is blending you know, juices and smoothies and superfoods into, we blend them or juice them because most of these people are really digestively exhausted. If they just chewed that food down, they wouldn't chew it well enough so that you could assimilate and digest those foods or the, the nutrients in the food rather. So I found a really easy way to kind of you know, skirt the system and to just you know, flood the body with nutrient in a way that the body could absorb and assimilate it. And um, you know, I work with many people who you know, we're told by the doctors that they had chemo and radiation and all kinds of surgeries and that they had no, no other options in, um, in modern medicine. And then they found the way to us, to me at the time and uh, my program. And many of those people are alive today. You know, uh, the body is a perfect self-correcting mechanism. And um, if we just uh, remove the toxins, all the known toxins and uh, flood the body with nutrient that the person recovers incredibly, actually, even from the most dire illnesses, in about three years, they're back on their feet again, working back aligned with their life's mission and purpose and um, off they go. So that's kind of, that's part of what I do, but that's a big part of what I do. And so right. then I've also set up about five different restaurants over the years too, especially the last like 20 years, um, where we do raw, raw, organic, vegan, you know, gourmet living foods. So it looks just like what you had, you know, known pecan pie or key lime pie or whatever it looks like to you, but that it's all raw, organic and living. All of the cheeses are made from nuts and some of them are fermented. So they're really, really full of nutrient. And, um, and then they're super tasty too. So I've kind of, I had to make it, you know, like from rabbit food, <laughs> what people thought right. Right. organic would be, you know, um, into just really delicious organic food that people um, love and seek out. And once you've had it, uh, then your body craves that. It craves that nutrient. It craves to evolve itself through the nutrients that it uh, takes in so once that sure. has um, that little switch has been uh, flipped then uh, then the person really seeks more living foods from that point on rather than you know the sugar and starches and lots of you know inorganic um, sodium and things like that that were you know the body becomes addicted to so once you kind of get over that then you'll naturally instinctively go to the foods um, that um, right from nature actually you know pick it off the tree You'll right. have more of an inclination to do that. What so is that's the, what I do. I line people back up with their natural instinct to find real food. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Good. Everything. Good. Perfect. Exactly yeah. what we want the theme of this episode to be. Mm -hmm. So I want to I wanna go back a little bit, and I want to ask you some questions. Um, sure. What, what do you think the single biggest threat in the food or to the food is that people are currently eating? What... With, for the average consumer that isn't really, doesn't really know much about how to eat organically or how to, what processed foods are or what, what do you think the single biggest threat is to the food that people are eating? Is it pesticides in that food? Is it just that they're processed? Is it how they're cooked and prepared? What would it be to you? Mm, I think it would be um, 
there's a couple things there, but eating nutrient devoid foods, right? Okay. And so how would that happen? Different. How would, for people who would know, how would you have nutrient, would that be genetically modified food? Is it, what would, what would um, that be? It would be just that it's, it's, it's boiled, ground, denatured, and then it's fried with a whole bunch of chemical flavorings and seasonings. And those chemical gotcha. flavorings come at a cost. And so, you know, there's whole industries for the last 40 years called, um, I actually, I knew them at one point, it's called the flavor and it's called um anyway it's what creates the aroma and the taste that overrides your your natural ability to know that that food that there's no actual nutrition in that food so that you know think of a potato chip but you know let's think, actually even think of like um i'll pick on uh doritos today right so that's just mm -hmm. a totally devoid food it's genetically modified corn so there's very little nutrient in the soil so there's very little nutrient in the food. It's grown mostly with um, nitrogens that uh, super grow the food. So it goes big, fast, huge, and, uh, and, and with the symmetry. So they're monocropped, right? So there's little diversity there. There's almost no range of nutrients and vitamins in that food. So corn, we're looking at corn right now, right? So they take that sure. corn, they store it because we have lots of um, grains stored um, in these huge silos, which make it very, very, very dry. Now you can store corn or any, any grain uh, in a Hessian bag in the right kind of air around it. Like when they opened up, and it'll last for thousands of years, you know, but if you improperly store it, it turns into this dust, right? Which is what they're making the food out of today. When they mm. opened up King Tut's tomb, they pulled out, um, kamut, which is an ancient lost grain. It was an ancient wheat, basically, and it hadn't been cultivated in a couple thousand years, but here it was, and they added some water to it. It sprouted, and now they have crops all over the world, especially in the, the Middle East, right? Wow. So that's how properly stored grain is supposed to last. Instead, what we do is we're putting in these, these big silos around the country. They get very, very dry. When you go to grind that into a meal, it should have a lot of moisture in it. The germ of life should be there. It's not any longer. It's ground into a powder. Now, nothing would eat that. Not even bugs eat that, right? And mice yeah. don't want to eat it. Rats don't want to eat it. But what they, so, and, and humans won't eat it either. So what they do is they grind it down. They make it into a deep fried chip. And then they put on top of that all these chemical flavorings and seasonings. So what it does is it excites your salivatory glands to death right? If you've ever yeah. tried to get like a kid who, you know, is raised on this kind of diet, right? Hot dogs, corn, you know, candies, you know, no real, no real nutrient, not like a broccoli, you sit down and have a bowl of broccoli and go, oh my God, that was delicious. But really just <laughs> eating a lot of addictive, high sugar, high fat, bad fats, and high um, salty, bad salts uh, in the diet. And what happens is it tricks the salivatory glands and you to make the, the glands think that, that this is real food and it, you just saliva like crazy, right? So these are called excitotoxins. They are designed to excite the hippocampus and the hypothalamus and all of the pleasure centers of your brain to go, oh my God, this is the most delicious chip I've ever had in my life. And what it does is it bypasses your natural ability, what's called the allosteric taste change response. So the allosteric taste change response is an inherent wisdom in our uh, ability to taste food. Once you taste it, you go, oh, that's food. It's delicious. I should eat more of it and it will make me healthy and whole. But with a potato chip or corn chip like this, like Doritos, it has all these flavors on it and stuff too. It tricks your mind into thinking that it's real food. And here's the kicker, it doesn't have a cutoff mechanism with it because it's just, you know, the switch is just turned on. And so you've done it yourself probably, you know, you eat a bag of Doritos and you're like, oh, that was a lot. I'm kind of sick. I should eat real food. What do you do? You re And somebody opens another bag, you reach over with your hand. <laughs> it's almost yeah. like your hand has a mind of its own because it's been chemically addicted. Just in that first bag, it becomes chemically hooked to, uh, to eat more of that food. And that's, some of the problem of the obesity that we have today in the in the modern world right right and and so when you consume that bag of doritos the, are those is that what they call empty calories super empty calories yes okay with a whole lot of chemical flavorings and those chemicals uh do uh do do damage to the brain 
right? Yeah. Not only do they do damage to the salivatory glands and your first defense to know what is food and what isn't food, that's something every animal has on the planet humans or animals. Um, but if you don't know the difference, then you would just eat anything, you know? And right. um, so this is, this is a wisdom that can be regained even if it was lost. Right. Which is good is to it, know. Is there a difference in consuming vitamins in food versus consuming them in supplement form? Sure. Absolutely. So How the food has, oh, it's a wonderful question. So the food has companion nutrients to it. Right, so if you eat an orange, you eat vitamin C in nature, you're gonna see vitamin C. It, it's a beautiful structure actually, and it has copper, uh, let me see if I can get this right, uh, tyronate, right. It has copper, tyrosinase, vitamin P, vitamin K, a thin layer of ascorbic acid on the outside. It has, there's something else in there too, I can't remember what it is. Anyway, there's another nutrient in there. So if you eat the orange or you eat rose hips or eat anything that's got vitamin, the vitamin C molecule naturally in it, your body knows exactly what to do with that. It can break it down. It's like, okay, here comes the vitamin C. Oh, great. We had a sunburn yesterday. We're going to put some vitamin C in that. The skin's going to heal nicely. We've got vitamin C to clean up the blood a little bit because, you know, she ate Doritos two nights ago. We got to clean that up. Um, and vitamin C naturally helps with, um, you know, streamlined bowel movements and uh, all kinds of beauty nutrients in the body. It makes the skin soft. It helps build collagen. So the body knows exactly what to do with that in nature, in the food, right? Right. So there's, and that, so that, what about supplements? So there's good supplements and there's poor quality supplements. The good supplements take a whole food and you know, grind it up and either give it to you in a powder or perhaps put it in capsules for your ease of consuming it, but it's a whole food. So you know, a good vitamin C is actually rose hips you know, or anything. There's so many, uh, I would look at the, to the herbal kingdom and the flowers for vitamin C because that's where you're gonna find the really rich, deep, dark matrix vitamin Cs that have you know, like a superfood would rather than, you know, we think of oranges having a lot of vitamin C, and they do, but they, um, they're not the, the, the condensed kind of vitamin C you're going to find in a flower like hibiscus or rose hip, that type of a thing. You sure. know, poor quality, poor quality supplements would take, would look at the matrix of that, that matrix vitamin C that I was describing earlier and say, oh, the active part of it is the ascorbic acid, right? So what we'll do is we'll, we'll scrape off the, the, the lining of ascorbic acid around the entire molecule, we'll throw everything else away. This is the pharmaceutical industry is doing this, right? <laughs> because that's right. what they do, great. And they say, ha, hey, here's the active component. Let's throw everything else out and let's take the ascorbic acid. Let's condense it. Let's um, you know, put that in a tablet. But here's what happens. So you can take a bottle of that or two bottles, especially if you had a pretty good diet, you'd be fine, right? But if you were just relying on that for your vitamin C intake, you didn't really eat any fruits or vegetables because there's vitamin C in all your greens and all kinds of things, right? Right. But if you don't really eat any fruits and vegetables, you're going to be taking that supplement with just the ascorbic acid. And what happens then is your body decides to create wholeness always. It always wants to seek to to create wholeness. So it's going to search in your body for extra copper, extra tyrosinase, um, whatever else was in the nutrient, the, the matrix of the whole vitamin C. And eventually it will, it will start to rob that from your body. So, um, so it's important to eat whole food, vitamin, mineral complexes. And it's important to have a really good diet of just eating plenty of fruits and vegetables. Vegetables are the really big healers. Um, but fruits are too, and fruits are nice because they have the fructose and all the organic um, sugars in them. Um, and most Americans, most people in the modern world eat a ton of refined sugar. And so, um, you know, just by adding the kind of the sweetness of life back in with that whole food, you can do fine with the fructose, you could do fine with the extra sugars that are in there as long as you have the companion minerals, actually minerals in this case, anchor down those sugars. And then the liver can understand what it is beautifully and break it down. It can store it for a longer period of time. You know, um, fast moving sugars like refined um, cane sugar or, you know, um, all of the even faster moving sugars that we have today, the high fructose corn syrup and this type of a thing. It really is a, it, it, it whips the system up to, um, to crave that food, right? And then sure. once the person's eating 
I think the average person in America, they, they figure has, eats about 120 pounds of sugar per person per year. And in the turn of the 1900s into 1901, the average person I think had about 10 pounds of sugar per year. So we've, we've added 110 pounds of sugar per year. And that is, um, uh, that runs the body down very quickly. It makes you very susceptible to mold, fungus, yeast, bacteria, parasites, and worms. And um, those are things that we think that are not affecting Americans, but they absolutely are. And um, and the cool part of it is the system is reversible. You know, within just a short right. period of time, a few meals in a row, you can eat more fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds and some fermented foods, and you'll feel better. You'll look better almost immediately. And, um, um, and, and so, you know, you're moving in the right direction. Like I, you know, I kind of, I really worked with thousands of post-op cancer patients. So that kind of became, that very much became the foundation of what I was basing things on. I thought, well, I'm seeing the same kind of blood profiles in people that, you know, don't have a cancerous situation and the people that have had cancerous situations. So people are just eating way too much sugar right now because sugar is, a, sorry, cancer is a sugar-based illness, right? It's from eating too much sugar. Right. And um, by just cutting that back, you know, modern medicine will say, oh, we're going to do some surgeries. We're going to do a chemo and some radiation, kind of try to cauterize uh, the tumor. And I say, well, the body, a tumor is the body's really creative way of just, you know, sweeping all of that necros material, that um, um, garbage, basically, that the body can't eliminate because there's too much that needs, needs to be eliminated. So all of the organs of elimination have been exhausted. So then a tumor starts to form. Then the body says, okay, well, you know, we can try to get it out of the mainstream of the blood. Let's build this tumor over here, or let's put it in the lymphatic system because that'll be the first thing that'll start to drain once, you know, um, this person finally starts to eat some vegetables <laughs> or whatever. Huh. Um, and so in that way too, you can see, you can feel yourself healing in the right direction. Whereas right. Like chemo and radiation oh. and surgery make you feel bad. You progressively get more ill. And the idea is to kill part of the body that's trying desperately to heal you uh, and trying to kill that off, kill off the immune system, um, well, certainly not respect the whole I, process I, of healing. I think all those, all those drugs are used and made to poison something and provoke a reaction is what they're attempting to do. But right. at the end of the day, you're still poisoning yourself. <laughs> yeah. And it's not really the kind of right thing. Is it even biopsies? It's like, Oh, well, here's this really sick organ. Like, let me just stick a bunch of pins in it and try to extract some of it. It's like, well, wait a minute. What are we, <laughs> what are we doing here? And I get it. Like diagnostics is really, we're sort of in the age of diagnostics now, which is kind of neat. You know, I mean, you really can look into the body in a bunch of different ways, not just biopsies, but all the MRI and all this stuff. So sure. in that it's important to um, uh, do the things that are obviously helping the body to heal. And you can see it with your own eyes, you know, even people, I mean, I work with, I've worked with a lot of sick people over the years, but then, you know, now I live in Hollywood and I work with a lot of actors and, you know, they like to party, they're wealthy, they're handsome or, you know, very pretty, they have a good life. But, so they like to kind of party and do their own thing. And then when they need to kind of clean up <laughs> because they just got paid millions of dollars to star in this next film, what they can do is just start to, you know, literally shift their diet over to, um, the fresh rot fruits and vegetables, do some green juices, and every day they'll get better looking. Uh, the sure. face becomes more symmetrical. The eyes get very bright and moist and blinking. They'll even be standing up straighter. All, a lot of infl you know, inflammatory pain in the body starts to self-correct. Sure. I want to go back to something you said. So when you eat an orange, your body knows what to do with the ingredients of the orange. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious... For people that have allergies to oranges and peanuts and things like this, what's your response mm. to why the bodies have those allergies? Why can't their bodies deal with oranges in the same way as other people? Mm. Okay. There's a couple different things that are happening there. First of all, this is probably the fourth or fifth or even sixth generation of uh, nutritionally deplete people. Just enough to keep alive just enough to keep going, just enough to be just under the disease phenomena, right? 
Yeah. And so, um, so they're overweight, they eat whatever they want. Um, but that's been happening generationally. And so then you have a degradation of the generations. And now that's, I think, what we're looking at here in America, which is, um, so, so what, is, what creates an allergy? An allergy is an intolerance, obviously, to a particular uh, stimulation. <clears throat> so what I already know if somebody has an allergy is they have an enormous amount of mold, fungus, yeast, bacteria, probably parasites and worms and all kinds of unidentified viruses in the liver and lots of heavy metals in the liver as well that are egging the, the viruses on or keeping them alive for at least keeping them existing. And in the gallbladder, there's an enormous amount of uh, material in there that the body is holding on to because the organs of elimination have not been emptied ever probably. So, um, but even that can be corrected in the, in just a couple of years in a person's lifetime, you know, and they'll start feeling better right away. Um, so look at peanuts, for example. So peanuts are, and also it's usually something that's been overdone for generations too. So peanut butter, right? Let's look at, <laughs> let's look at sure. peanut butter, the, the humble peanut, if you will. Yeah. Um, peanuts are not tree fruits. They are, um, they grow underground. So they are really, um, they have a lot of what's called aflatoxin. So there's, there's a lot there in the mold kingdom to trigger somebody. So a lot of the houses people are living in today are also mold centric, right? So they're sort of built in such a way that they can be airtight. Um, and then there's going to be a little moisture behind the walls, um, a little humidity, and then you can get this black mold. You get all kinds of mold, but that's the really deadly kind. And a lot of times people will live in that house for decades and not notice that they have an enormous amount of mold on it. So when you eat peanut butter or anything else that also has this aflatoxin or mold to it, it can really trigger an allergic response that can be lethal, right? Right. Now, do they, do, do they even know they're living in a moldy house? Probably not. If they're not aware enough to know to have a really good diet, they're probably not aware enough to know that they're living in a house with mold. So if you find that over and over again, if you're born into a house with mold, um, also that's going to compromise the immune system. If your mother put, you know, Coca-Cola in your your bottle when she, you know, because she didn't have anything else, she thought, well, it's Coke, you know, and and um, you know, your diet was just a lot of cereals that had sugar as the first ingredient, you know, this kind of a thing um right throughout the life they were maybe not breastfed so they they don't even have the original uh microbes that have been passed down through generations for thousands of years those microbes are life-saving and i think we're going to find um with any kind of thing like the pandemic and stuff of 2020 what we're going to find is that we're going to start to look at people who uh, came in contact with the disease but didn't have any response to it whatsoever coated antibodies and kept on going, um, as opposed to the people that really did suffer, um, those people are already suffering on a biochemical level, I can tell you. And well, just even look at the, 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 um, uh, the deaths themselves. If you look at the CDC, you can see who are the people that are actually dying. These are people with compromised immune systems because they've never paid attention to their diet. They probably don't have an exercise program. You know, they sit around a lot, they have a sedentary lifestyle. And so those people are going to have a lot more allergies. They're going to have more uh, sensitivities um, uh, to things that are, you know, toxic. So why would an orange be, you know, an allergen or to people, right? Sure. Those people, I can tell you almost exclusively, those people were not breastfed. Um, now in this generation, they probably weren't even vaginally born. They were they were born through a C-section, so they don't have the microbiome on their skin or in their mouth, or in their digestive tract. We have three microbiomes of the body. And so uh, the outside, the skin, gets inoculated at a vaginal birth, which is how we're supposed to be born, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, through the mouth by, you know, the mom kissing, basic, you know, kissing the baby, also from uh, breastfeeding. The first couple of days, there's colostrum that flows from the breast that seeds the digestive tract of that baby for life. They're so important. That is huge. And then, um, so that gets the mouth microbiome and the gut microbiome in a good place. So I can tell you, I can just tell you by, you know, <laughs> yeah. if you tell, if, if, if you tell me that the mother wasn't paying attention to her diet and exercise, 
and um, and the baby was a C-section and not breastfed. I can tell you, she's gonna have here. She's gonna have all kinds of ear, nose, and throat issues. They're always gonna have a challenge with the microbiome because they don't have it. It's very difficult to rebuild. Very difficult to rebuild, though it can be done. And now there's a lot of people that are focusing on it, which is great. Um, but um, that child for life is going to have a compromised immune system that's completely overlooked, right? Like it's right. just overlooked. Like during the 80s, I remember a lot of my friends were having babies and um, the doctor was like, so is this your last baby? Or are we just going to take it out? Are we just going to take the uterus out? You won't have to worry about it. You won't have another period. It's going to be awesome. And what I know about all those women is that their children were compromised uh, because they don't have the microbiome on the skin. And the, um, the women, often their marriages were destroyed after that because it completely takes out your sex drive and where they had had perhaps a, self, you know, a healthy sex drive enough to make a baby, right? <laughs> At least something right. was working right there. But right. afterwards it becomes just, you know, just almost down to nothing. And so that destroys families. You know, those are, right. we're going through a lot of experimental time right now too. You know, nobody's wrong, but those are certainly things that do not um, create, you know, family strength and also uh, universal Im immunity, you know? Right. You mentioned that your body, uh, your body wants wholeness and does your body crave what it needs? Oh yes. Oh yes. And we have the ability to find food and water anywhere we are. Every animal does. And so, you know, you can walk up to any plant and, um, well, you see animals do this all the time. You know, one plant might attract them and they'll eat a little bit of it and one, another plant won't, you know? So we have the ability to know what that is. There's so if, I, if I'm craving a candy bar, what is that telling me? <laughs> what am I deficient in? Yeah, you're looking for some fast sugars to pick up your brain uh, activity with, right? So sugar, uh -huh. the brain, brain runs on sugars, right? And uh, you're probably looking to pick up your energy, right? Yeah. So the other way to get that would be to eat, you know, you know, fruits and vegetables with it, get a real pickup. So eat the candy bar. So, you know, have the candy bar, right? And what happens is you chew up that candy bar. It comes into the stomach. It starts to break it down. Hopefully you chewed it really, really well. Most people don't chew well enough, but here it goes and it's moving over and the liver is starting to become involved. So the liver looks at it and goes, okay, holy hell, what is this? It's a firestorm of sugar activity. It's a very refined very refined, very fast moving sugar. The, these are new sugars. Nobody really had, I mean, we're, we're millions of years in evolution here today, but refined white sugar is super new, like in the last 100, 125 years, that's it, right? We don't have it. Honey is way more complex. Maple syrup is way more complex. You know, there's sweet things that we have been using, um, but they were very hard to get and they were very difficult to, um, well, difficult to obtain, right? Have you ever tried to get honey from a, a live honey bee, you know, <laughs> right. a, right. a right. hanging right. hive somewhere? I mean, they are fierce. Yeah. So there was always kind of a real danger to it and kept you away from it. But, um, oops, I lost my track of thought. So say it again. Oh, so, right. well, so we were talking about what the body craves. So I want to just say, so it's interesting oh. for me personally, um, you know, like, I know when it's time to eat dinner and I, and mm -hmm. I've, I've told you before, like, I'm not really necessarily a foodie. I look at food as just fuel so I can keep going <laughs> and keep working, mm -hmm. you know? And sure. so I haven't really, I don't really take in that many fine dining experiences. Like I don't want to devote the time to that. I don't want to, you know, and it's terrible of me probably to be that way, but I look at food as fueling up. Hopefully it's good food. Sometimes it's not <laughs> many times it's fried. I'm guilty of these things. Um, but it's interesting to me because I kind of know when dinner time is and when I need to go eat, but I'm not necessarily craving anything versus when I'm actually craving wanting to snack on a cucumber or carrots or wanting to have a candy bar. Like those are very specific things where I know it's a snack. I'm craving a particular thing versus when I just need to have a meal. Does that make sense at all? Is that mm -hmm. the difference really between the two things or does that define mm -hmm. what the craving is? Um, because my body does want something in that cucumber, right? Or it does want something in the carrots. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm craving that. Yeah, exactly. And we do crave things like that. You know, we, we would crave that. Somebody might think that we're craving sugar in the same way that an alcoholic would crave a, a cocktail. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, there's a craving there, but is it grounded? Is it not? Is it 
healthy? And is it something that on the other side of it, they're going to feel nourished, you know, mm -hmm. or do they just need another candy bar or another cocktail or whatever? <laughs> they just get down the road a little bit further. Is so the craving coming, is the craving coming from the mind or is it coming from the body? A uh, bit of both, right? A bit of both. Okay. And so you need more nutrient. So the body's going, hey, I could use some nutrient here. The thing with eating the candy bar is that your body will break it down into its usable parts. There's a ton of sugar in there. So the liver can't really hang on to it. So it's going to feed that sugar directly into the bloodstream. And um, what happens then is very important. So what happens then is that the, there's a ton of sugar in the bloodstream. And so it it, it demands that the pancreas start to produce insulin at a very high, very fast rate. So sugar in this, in this case, for an analogy, if you will, is sort of like a bushfire, right? And insulin is like the water in a fire hose, right? Trying to put it out. So what happens is if you're eating sugar on a cyclical system like that, and, and there's a ton of sugar just hidden in foods too, like unless you're a bit of a you know, a label reader or whatever, you know, you might think, well, this isn't that sugary and stuff, but there's a ton of sugar in it. So, so what, what it sets up that system. And then um, what most of the diseases that we're dealing with today is what's called insulin resistance diseases. I would even say cancer is in there, diabetes, obesity, I would say even MS and certain things like that are caused from this, this sugar uh, consuming insulin put out the fire kind of cycle so what happens then is the body really should you know only have to you know produce some insulin every once in a long while so if you look at the last you know 10,000 years how often have you had you know how often have we had all the honey that we wanted or how often is that fig tree going off you know like yeah, you'll stand there and eat as many figs as you can because you're supposed to because you're gatherers and hunters, you know, gathering the food. But that's when a little insulin would be produced. You know, the fig tree is going to cycle in and out of its, its fruit. You know, there's going to be a lot, a lot more time when it's not giving fruit than when it is. And so the insulin comes back into as a, a rescue mechanism to put out that kind of fast, mid, well, a, a, a sugar, a, an excess of sugar, let's put it that way. But sure. certainly refined sugar. So that's what's called the insulin resistances. And those are the basis of all of our health problems today. It really is sugar. Yeah, right, right. Let's talk mm -hmm. about let's talk about what is an alkaline body. Mm, okay. Um, okay, so an alkaline body, um, so so we're looking at the pH of things, right? So the pH range is from one to fourteen. The first seven are acid, uh, acids, acidic, and um, the seven through 14, sorry, eight through 14 is um, alkaline. And so in a perfect world, in a perfect diet, we're going to look at about 80% of the diet to be alkaline forming. So, all, so just to make it real easy, all fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds are alkaline forming in the body, even if it's like an acid fruit or a subacid fruit. Those are just those are words that describe um, the uh, tanginess of something, but not actually the alkalinity of it or the acidicness of it, you know what I sure. mean, on that pH range. Right. So we want to eat about 80% of our diet to be alkaline, alkaline forming in the body, and then about 20% could be acidic. So meats are acidic, um, meats and you know, fishes and things like that are acidic. Cooked food is acidic uh, to some degree. Uh, and then certainly any of the, you know, the, the I don't want to call it, like chips and, and cakes and pies and desserts and all of these kind of things. They're all acid forming in the body. So if you want to live a healthy life, you can really look at it like that. And if you go to the 80-20, um, you're going to do okay, you know. Um, and even, you know, even, and not, it's not all cooked foods, but certainly all denatured foods, um, sure. especially if they add, you um, or if they fry anything, you know, anything fried is going to be acidic to the body. And actually this, this equation of the 80, 20, um, you can, you can dial it down pretty, pretty far too, and still keep a pretty good diet. If you, it doesn't have to be an everyday thing, but it has to be a majority of the time. So, you know, not certainly if you're, you're recovering from an illness, you want to really look at your daily diet, you know, but most people can look at it over the course of a week. Like I feel pretty good. Uh Oh, I went to a, you know, a birthday party a couple of days ago. I had cake and ice cream. Da, da, da. So the next day, guess what? I'm just going to do kind of fruits and vegetables today. I'm going to have a nice little ease in my digestion. That's healthy and normal. 
But if every day it's cakes and pies and cookies and a lot of sugar, even we put sugar in our bread in America. I don't know if you have any friends from other parts of the world, but every time my friends come here from like Australia or wherever, they're like, sugar in your bread, sugar <laughs> in the bread. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I get it. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> there's sugar in everything. So what are the hazards? Mm -hmm. okay. What are the hazards of having too acidic of a body? What's going to happen to you with having the needle pointed in that direction more? Oh, incredible. A uh, compromise to the immune system, especially to the um, musculature of the body. Super acidic people. Um, and it can be really hidden too. So um, one of the big acids that's kind of hidden today is like the diet Cokes and diet sodas and things like this, right? So they're sweetened with like a NutraSweet or a um, aspartame or, you know, these fake sugars. And then the person thinks, oh, I'm doing something really good for myself. I'm having this diet soda instead of a full sugar soda that's made with high fructose corn syrup. And that's true to a point, but it's wildly acidic as a nutritive. So, so if you're looking at like a perfect beverage, it would be like a balanced water, maybe slightly alkaline, right? So I wrote a book called Secrets of an Alkaline Body, The New Science of Colloidal Biology. And in it, I'm telling everybody how to become more alkaline just because everybody is so wildly acidic. So take the person who eats, okay, you know, but they'll drink like six Diet Cokes a day or something or diet sodas of some kind, right? And then all of a sudden they'll have a mysterious illness, kind of like a fibromyalgia, which is like a roving, moving pain around the body that can be cramping in certain places. Um, and um, I know a number of people that were, you know, admitted to hospital, you know, that became clients of mine later. And uh, they could never figure it out. You know, they, they were in a hospital for six or seven days. They couldn't figure it out because there's a huge, get, you know, uh, just a lack of information about nutrition's role in health in America, for sure. And um, anyway, so, so then they get better because they didn't have any sodas, diet sodas while they were in the hospital, right? And so they come back out. I start drinking their diet sodas again at the same kind of rate. And I can tell you six diet sodas a day will eventually compromise your immune system and it'll make it, um, first of all, it's real, okay, so a diet soda itself, everything has a pH scale. A diet soda is about a pH of about two to three, right? Which is super, super acidic. And this kind of acid corrodes things. If you know anything about cars, you know, you can see acid corroding metal even, right? And um, in the body, it can function in the same type of way. So, so um, the lining of the stomach has to have qu quite a thick layer of um, kind of like a mucus. It's a protective coating, right? It has to be a protective coating because the stomach contents are very, very acidic. They're designed to break down all kinds of meals, right? Sure. So when people have acid, and when they have like an acid reflux, which is the beginning of this whole cycle uh, that will eventually lead to ulcers and this type of a thing, it's because they're, they're, the, the perfect pH of the stomach is compromised through, like the body's going to assume that you're going to be eating more alkaline forming foods. But if you're only eating acidic foods, eventually it's going gonna, it's gonna to make the stomach acid even more acidic. And then it'll cause like a whole host of digestive issues, depending on where your weak link is. You know? So if people have sort of you know, a burping, acid reflux kind of thing, eventually they could even get esophageal problems like cancers and things like that over a period of a lifetime, uh, or it might go the other way, it might go into the digestive tract and then they'll have, um, you know, uh, problems in the digestive tract with, you know, ulcerative colitis is an end stage of that. And so it's all kinds of, um, you know, scanty pee poos and things where people have um, uh, what's called a leaky gut syndrome. So leaky gut syndrome is, is huge in America, and I would say probably in the Western world. And most of these people die of a heart attack. And um, the cause of death is heart attack. But I can also say if that heart attack is there, I know for a fact they've got leaky gut syndrome. And that means that there's material that in the digestive tract, in the intestine, that should be really protected in there. And it's not. There's all kinds of fissures and cracks and so on where the contents of the intestine is actually very slowly leaking into the abdominal cavity over years this creates a wildly acidic situation that eventually does stop the heart but they're not looking at the whole system which is really digestion to do with right. that heart attack you, you talk about in your book 
uh, Secrets of an Alkaline Body, you refer to dirty blood and how oh, alkaline yes. beverages can be absorbed, uh, you know, into the body to purify the dirty blood. So let's talk about dirty blood, the concept behind this, what this is, because the, oh, ultimately fantastic. you're going to make your body inhospitable to cancer by moving your, the needle to alkaline more than acidic is what mm -hmm. I'm getting from this. But, but let's talk about dirty blood for a minute, what you mean by that. Okay. So there's a wonderful um, a school of uh, body of knowledge right now too called live blood cell analysis. And so always before we had to take a little drop of blood and then we had to stain it. And it was basically dead blood that we'd look at under a microscope, you know, but now we can look with these beautiful electron microscopes and you can look at the organic beauty of living blood, you know, and we can learn so much about it because you could just see what is healthy, active, living blood that has a lot of polarity in it, and really healthy polarity. So healthy blood is when like two red blood cells that are really beautiful and round and good shaped, right? You want a big round red blood cell. When two red blood cells meet in the blood, they are so polarized and ma magnetized off each other. They just push off of each other. There's a power to the blood. How strong and clean your blood is is how strong and clean your mind is and your energy level, right? Sure. So dirty blood becomes very compromised, mostly through dehydration. Most people don't hydrate enough and they eat very de um, dehydrating foods, right? So food that doesn't have a natural amount of hydration to it. If you take a tomato, it's like 80% water, you know? So if you eat a tomato, you're eating plenty of water and you're hydrating your system. If you eat a bag of corn chips, uh, that's very dehydrating. All of the water has been taken out of the corn and any of the food, the actual fruits and vegetables or grains that was in there. And so it's very dehydrating. So your body has to hydrate that food just to push it through from the mouth all the way down <laughs> and out of the mm. body again, right? It right. dehydrates you. So then the blood becomes very thick and very purple and very dirty, right? So you want like bright, bright, bright red blood. And um, dirty blood also denotes, you know, dirty air as well. And a lack of uh, ozone uh, in a natural way in, in, in throughout the, you know, just clean air. So air is constantly clean by trees, for example, right? That they, they breathe in what we breathe out and, they, and we breathe in what they breathe out, you know, so the CO2 and so on. Um, so there's a beautiful organic relationship there. So, but if you live in a dirty city and you only get like a certain amount of negative ions, so negative ions are cast off by nature. They're very, it says negative, but they're very healthy for you. So we always have negative ions around moving water, so a waterfall or rainfall or anything like that. And that kicks out a lot of ozone too. So it's the ozone that cleans us in the air that we breathe um, when it's in forests or anywhere where it's close to nature. That's why it's important to have house plants and things like that in your home. Um, but people that are just breathing in, you know, exhaust and um, the outgassing of, of industry and very dirty air, their, their blood is going to look like that too. Their lungs will and so with their blood. So you can tell dirty blood if you look into somebody's eyes and they have a lot of, um, a lot of red blood, you know, a lot of red, uh, what do you call it? The vascular system, the veins, red, <laughs> red veins in their eyes or right. a kind of a gray pallor to the whites of the eyes. Certainly if they have lines on their faces that have, um, you know, people get lines on their faces, even children do. But if you have like a dark crevasse, that's very dark and dark lines on the face and the body and the color is sort of yellow to green to uh, purple colors, it's subtle, but most people will notice that if you do like study somebody's face or a photograph of somebody's face, you can see what colors are coming through. And if they're dark, dirty colors, you can know that the blood is really really dirty and very viscous. And so in my work, that's one of the things I scan for. As soon as a new client comes to me, I'm, I'm scanning their face. I'm looking, reading their physiognomy. I read iridology as well. I look into their eyes. Inside of the iris of the eye is a perfect map of every organ of the body. So you can get a real easy read on which organs are strong and which need vitality. And you can also see the blood too in the circulatory system, just right in the face. You can, I can read it in everybody. You can even see it in their aura which like we talked about before, the curling camera photographs so beautifully. Once you become trained to it, every single person can see energy fields. Uh, we just sort of talked out of it and we, you know, pay less attention to it than you would if we, you know, we're all living an indigenous life in the Amazon jungle, for example. You, those would be the teachings that everybody would have. 
Um, sure. So dirty, dirty blood means there's a lack of hydration, there's a lack of nutrient, and then the body, sorry, the blood cells become very sticky to each other instead of pushing off of each other like healthy blood, they clump together and they stick together. And so with live blood cell analysis, you can just look at somebody's blood and you can see these long, big, you know, floats of, of poorly shaped red blood cells. They look like, you know... Um, more like a, a kidney bean shape, or they're small, some are large, they're not uniform at all. Um, and then they cling together because there's a ton of mold and yeast in there. And you can even see parasites like trying to wiggle into, um, you know, red blood cells or try to find a host in there because there's so much material um, right. for the body. So actually parasites are, are one of nature's ways of helping you to deal with really, really dirty blood. Um, because it'll help to eat that material and they'll break it down. Yeah, so so and point, healthy and blood. Pointing, pointing mm -hmm. the needle back to alkaline is going to help clear that blood up. Indeed, yeah, indeed. So our water, you know, like in Secrets of an Alkaline Body, I'm saying, oh, we'll drink more highly alkaline water. And I, I'm saying that because most people are severely acidic. If you have any kind of health conditions, for the most part, you're probably more acidic and you need to just re-alkalize your body with highly alkaline you know, charged water, which I talk a lot about in my work. The kind of water we drink is very important. It, you know, it shouldn't have all these toxins in it like fluoride and, and uh, chlorine and all of that. You know, you want like really healthy, good water. So a good water filtration system is one of the best investments that anybody can make because we are, you know, we're born, we're two thirds water. If you look at the earth, actually, the earth is two thirds water too. So when we're born, we're two thirds water. We're just like the earth. And then when we're about 50, 60 years old, if we do, we do a scan, we can see that most of the body, most bodies that are in that age range are down to about 50% water. So where there should be hydration, where there should be hydraulics through water, there isn't. And so the body becomes very sluggish, the, bid, the blood becomes viscous, and it's just kind of, it's really hard on the heart too, because it's had to push the blood through instead of it being real light lots of vitality in the blood and very effortless for the heart to, to pump that blood, you know, sure. so alkaline water helps us with that. In a perfect world, it would be a perfect pH. I think Evian water, uh, when it started to be tapped about 120 years ago or something, their thing was, oh, well, it's the perfect pH of seven. It's the perfect food for your, sorry, the perfect water for your newborn infant or your elderly. It's right there in the middle, which is true. But now because we've become so much more acidic, I would say it's better to move the needle into a higher degree of alkalinity for your water. And, uh, and then you can get away with, you know, we're living in the modern world, you know, we're going to sure. eat a chip sometimes. <laughs> it's not about being perfect, but it's about having good health. Right, right. So how does one test their pH? Oh, you can get these little pH strips, which are fantastic. They're inexpensive. Um, I think I carry them on my web website, AnnieJub.com. I'll have a look okay. after we get off the show. But if not, I can put them back up there. But they're fun because what it is is you have this little tiny spool of, of pH-sensitive paper, and you can just rip off a little bit, and you can t you test the pH of your saliva. And it should be pretty cl – it should be slightly acidic. So slightly acidic is anywhere from the six to seven on your pH range. It, what it is, it turns the pH uh, paper a color, right? And then you match it up sure. with the colors. So super dark purple and blues are going to be more alkaline. And then um, the more acidic it is, the more yellows and, you know, the lighter colors. And so um, you, should t you can test your, you know, keep it in the bathroom and you can test your urine by just catching a little bit of urine and, um, and then separately, of course, your saliva. And so you kind of want it around like the saliva should be just slightly acidic and then the, the urine can be just slightly alkaline. So it'll be in the darker purple phase. But here's a really good experiment. If you have something that you absolutely love to do, I went for a while there where I was just loving wine, you know, and I was like, well, what's this wine doing to my pH, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I want to know. Right. So at one point I like, I had some friends over and, and I was like, okay, I want to see everybody here. We're going to like have a glass of wine and we're all, we're going to do a test beforehand, see where our pH is. And then after one glass of wine and then after two glasses of wine, right? And no food. I didn't feed anybody then too. And so we just kind of played with it all night. But um, so everybody started with kind of a pH of maybe 
let's say seven, right, or very slightly acidic. After the first glass, it went down a full pH towards acid and then another full pH. So people that start out with a pH of like seven, all of a sudden they've got a, a saliva or a urine pee, especially urine is easier to, 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 wa to watch it change, right? It was, you know, super acidic. And I was like, God, just two glasses. So then we started eating food and then we we're testing it and stuff too. And, and basically you can, you know, it's part of why they serve food in bars, right? They at least give you a little thing of chips or something to kind of munch on. It's better in Europe because it'll actually make you like an actual little snack, you know, and they serve it to you whenever you have a glass of wine or whatever for your happy hour. And that's really an important thing. And that's probably why uh, the Europeans don't have the same kind of, uh, there's a lot of reasons, but they don't have the same kind of health problems that Americans do because typically, um, you know, even if you're going to have something known to be acidic, which is an alcoholic beverage, uh, they're not serving you anything with it. And just having a little something to eat with it, you know, even some, like what you're saying, like a little bit of crudite or a little hummus or something like that, it can keep your blood and your saliva and your urine, you know, in a really nice pH neutral seven, right? And that's Interesting. what you're looking for. Yeah. Interesting. So I want to move into kind of the, the last segment of the podcast. And I want to kind of take a, a deep dive into something different. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to kind of just put a little of my own commentary in here real quick before we get into it. Because this, this particular podcast is a little bit different than what I have been recording with people. So a lot of the podcasts that I've done so far, and many of these haven't even come out yet, um, have been support, so kind of support interviews for my, my book, Metatomics, The Grand Design. And what uh, I think I definitely talked about this on this podcast, but I'm currently writing the next book. And yeah. the next book actually covers uh, a, a lot of, lot of different things. And it, it, instead of it being a, this, this, this vast story that the first book was, it's more of a, an individual type um, type of book and it's about people's um attuning their their physiology really is what it's about and uh, mm. what i kind of have started to put together for this next book is you kind of an operator operating a mechanism and the operator is the soul in your body and the mechanism is the body and and what I wanted to do was to get people to align those things. So I wanted to put people through these uh, the series of kind of physical and mental attunement states to be able to really maximize what the body is capable of doing. Because the body can do great things that I think most people aren't aware that it can do. Yeah. And that's what I want to move into in this section. So I believe that this mechanism has powers that it can use. And one of those is the power to heal itself. Um, and the yeah. human body should, in theory, be able to replace or replicate any part of itself under ideal circumstances. And yeah. one of those ideal circumstances has to do with the fuel it takes in, which is why I definitely wanted you to be a guest on this show. So um, what I wanted to kind of go into and lead into with this is we're going to go microscopic on this. We talked about mm. grabbing an orange and eating it and how to change what's going on in your body, but I want to take this down even further. So I want to kind of lay out a little backstory here. Um, so, you know, essentially your body is a community made up of about a hundred trillion cells. And if in some, if you basically, if something infects that community, it can spread because it's a closed system. It's going to spread in you. So there are about a hundred thousand human diseases on record that we've identified um, and then I would say that these, there are probably four main types of diseases. So now science will probably say there's many other categories and subcategories of this, but I kind of narrow it down to about four. And that's infectious diseases, deficiency diseases, hereditary diseases, and uh, physiological diseases. Sure. But to me, there's really only one disease, and that's the disease of the malfunctioning cell. So if, in my opinion, you don't really have cancer or Alzheimer's, what you have are malfunctioning cells. And yeah. the reason why the cells malfunction is because they're not getting something they need, which is called deficiency, or they're getting something they don't need, which is called toxicity. And the, to me, those are the two causes of disease. Um, so... For one, I wanted to see how you felt about that, <laughs> my theory on this. But I think the good news around this is that, you know, new cells are created continuously 
and we create about 40 million cells a second. And what I think is interesting and what I want to get into with this with you is the membrane surrounding the cells is made of oil. Um, so cell membranes are constructed from fatty acids. Oils are fats that are a liquid at room temperature, to my understanding. So when you eat poison, such as canola oils, your body uses that yeah. oil. It needs to find the oil in your body to make cells. So you're kind of, what you consume is what you create in the new cells. So you're, you could be making a membrane out of crap food, a cell membrane out of crap food. So I wanna see, does this, does this theory hold water to you? Let's get down to the cellular level of this in nutrition. How do you feel mm -hmm. about this and what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you touched on some really interesting things. So first of all, I agree with what you were saying too, is that the disruption of ease, which is what we call dis-ease, the disruption of ease of the body is to do with too many toxins and not enough nutrient. That's the base. You were spot on with that. And um, in terms of the, I think you're talking about apoptosis, which is basically the cell death and cell, cell splitting and cell rejuvenation, right? So cells. Yes. So then you're also tapping into kind of what makes us humans too. There's all kinds of magic that goes on with that too, because we, you know, we've all seen people that just, there's no good reason why they're still alive. And yet there they are, you know, they're still moving, they're still getting <laughs> done, you know, and the body, you know, it just it has has uh, continued on so there's life force and life force is bigger than um this toxin and nutrient system that we were just talking about mm, in a lot of different ways so you know what what's so special about an egg that meets a sperm and then the, all this incredible uh sacred geometry happens you know at that point where the cells divide subdivide you have a the zika you know you have all of the different uh, sacred geometries to that create life, right? They create a new life. Sure. So there's some magic that goes on on that level too, which is, you know, the subatomic level. And so um, there's going to be, um, there's going to be people that are, you know, a bit like, um, was it Rasputin where they'd given him like tons and tons of you know, poisons and he just wouldn't stop. He just kept going like something that would have killed a horse. He was just going and going. So there's kind of a bigger, a bigger thing that we are, and that is, you know, we're spiritual beings having a human experience, but the soul is vast and the soul overrides actually the physical, I would say. And, um, and it, there's a whole hierarchy of angels that govern, that govern cell uh, production in the body, certainly. And, um, you know, so I'm not sure what your question is. I like I like the direction you're moving in there. What do well, you the question? So the question is, are we using nutrients in our body creating the cells? And are they and is the oil particularly important in that use? Oh yeah. Mm, oh absolutely. Okay. So so oils are not super, super, super important for us to have. There's oils in pretty much everything, a lot of things, right? Or fatty things. So like even an avocado or any nuts and seeds. Certainly the worst oils that people are using today are what you just said with the canola oil. And, um, um, but cold pressed oils can also be an amazing medicine, right? And they, they can be very important to certain things. So, so in, in my work, when I, you know, so you could say that I reverse the conditions of degenerative diseases through raw living foods, right? Sure. So one of the, one of the medicines to the liver is is oils, right? Fats and oils. And it can be the toxin, you know, if you have a ton of canola oil and you fry everything, then there's going to be a lot of rancid oils that the liver's hanging on to. But the way to liberate that too is through really, you know, organic cold pressed oils. So in my liver and gallbladder flesh, which is the foundation of my detox system, uh, it involves consuming quite a bit of cold pressed oil. I use olive oil and quite a bit of uh, lemon juice as well. And there's quite a few other things that go to it, but what that does is by flooding the body with, with, with those oils, it allows the body to give up and release the toxic oils that had been holding on to and clinging to, in fact. Uh, the brain also needs to, to have these kind of oils to, um, to run well on, right? Sure. And to, repl and to replicate itself. So brain cells very much are important uh, to have a really good source of fat to replicate brain cells. So each of the cells of the body are kind of require different things, you know? Um, 
but to be able to drink a bit of olive oil with lemon juice in it, even as a, well, that's what our, our, um, our salad dressings are, right? If you look at the micronutrients of it, you know, it's like right. oils and lemon juice right. and acid <laughs> and an oil. <laughs> And, um, and that helps us break down salads, right? Because the, the salad greens, we need a little bit of extra, um, like an, uh, an acid in there. And then the oils allow us to, um, to, for the liver to hang on to that. And then it also heals the liver too, because a nutritive food, especially if you've been eating a toxic food that's the same kind, uh, it liberates. It allows the body to release those rancid oils, which will be right throughout the body, incredibly in the blood in the bloodstream as well. It'll release that, and there's a new supply, a better supply, and that's kind of a nice little um, law of the body too, is that it will release the toxins if you give it a like in a nutrient that is uh, supportive of that system. Sure, and it always so does. So you, you uh, mentioned olive oil, and there's a lot of seed oils. There's rose hip seed oil and hemp seed oil mm. and cranberry seed oil. We also mm. have coconut oils and oils from nuts and all types of things. Are there certain oils in those categories that are better than others? And also, how do aromatherapy essential oils fit into this? Because they do absorb into the skin. You do get some of those oils in the body. Are these all relatively the same, these oils, or are they different? They're different, but you're on the right track. So the, 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 um, the best oils are cold, slow, pressed, right? So expeller pressing squeezes and presses and there's heat involved, right? So oils are very fragile to do with heat. You know, you want to have a real low heat and then they'll last forever and they'll stay around for a long time. Um, the best oils I would say are coconut, cold pressed olive oils, anything that's organic. So if you don't care about organics, but you want to get one foot in the ink, you know, and you start to buy more organic foods, start with your oils, your butter, your cold pressed oils, anything with fat in it, because the pesticides hang out in fat. And they're all the pesticides on the planet are estrogenic. So they screw up the estrogen receptor sites of both men and women. So it's very important to avoid the, the stockpiling of pesticides in oils by doing organic oils, cold pressed oils. And then those are amazing too, cold pressed, you know, walnut oil or, you know, flaxseed. Um, the coconut oils are really wonderful because they're very stable and you can cook at high heats with them, but you can also have them raw. Um, I encourage everybody to have about two tablespoons of the cold pressed oil every day that's organic. And in that way, the blood became, you know, keeps the blood very slippery. Slippery blood is very healthy blood. And it also makes your skin really beautiful too. It looks moist. It has a nice amount of emollients to it. And then there's a lot of tiny little crevasses in the body that require a moist um, oil at those very sense, all the women's vaginal system, all of our reproductive organs are very, it's very important that we have some kind of these cold pressed oils in our diet. And even some of the uh, infertility that we're seeing now has to do with a lack of oils or, sorry, a lack of cold pressed organic oils and a bunch of these expeller pressed uh, trans fatty acid oils, right? Everything that's deep fried, for example, is a trans fatty acid. Sure. Sure. Well, Annie, it's been a pleasure having you on this podcast. I've learned a lot. And that's what I like with these is I want to learn too. And that's why I invite the guests that I invite because <laughs> you're an expert in your field. And I wanted to just really, we probably could have talked about, we've talked on the phone for hours about all kinds of topics. We're really isolating this down to nutrition today. Hopefully you'll come back and we'll do a different discussion on a different topic. But I definitely wanted to, uh, to hear you tell me about this crash course in this. And I, I want to say, <laughs> Is there one thing, any, is there one piece of advice you would give to people listening now that want to kind of migrate over from an unhealthy diet lifestyle to getting started in something simple and on, that, on the right path to eating right? What's the first thing? What's one piece of advice you will give? The simple start. Absolutely. The simple start is just to walk through a fruit and vegetable market and pick the thing that calls to you the most. It might be a papaya. It might be a potato. Who knows? When's the last time you made your own potato? You know, that's not fried, blah, blah, blah. But be attracted to it. Be, the color will draw you. The shape is going to draw you. The smell, the fragrance is going to draw you. And then just devote that meal tonight, you know, either 
you know, it might just be an orange where you sit down and enjoy the orange or something, but incorporate it in, into your meal and, and do it with a raw living thing. So even if you're having a cooked meal or something, you can say, oh, what can I add to this that'll make, uh, that'll be raw, organic and living? Oh, I'll chop up some tomato and just throw it on the top, almost like a garnish, but look at all the enzymes that are in that. So just be, a, be, be generous with yourself and also to, to let your senses guide you to the food that's the most healing for you right now. We all go through little phases of, you know, oh, I couldn't get enough raspberries. I ate them through the entire season like that. You know, that's the nutritive in those raspberries that are healing lots of hormones in there. So maybe you're using extra hormones or a little more stressed, you know, and the adrenal glands need that hormonal support. So, you know, be very intuitive. Each of us is an instinctive eater. We are earthlings. We belong to the earth. The food here is made for us, just as it's made for the deer and the tiger. So it's, it's, our, it's our birthright to be able to find the foods that are medicinally, medicinally contain the highest quality foods to heal whatever's going on inside of us, whether it's emotional, mental, physical, all of those things. And each one of them can be uh, healed and addressed with uh, nutrition. Well, what a beautiful way to wrap up the podcast. Beautiful words, beautiful words, really. Mm. Tell us, when, tell, tell everyone how they can, how they can find you. You're on, you have a dot com and you're also, are you on social media too? How can people find? Yeah. Find I mean, I, you can find everything through AnnieJub.com, J-U-B-B, AnnieJub.com. And you can find me on Instagram at Annie.Padden.Jub, but you can find all that at AnnieJub too. And my products are there and, um, I, um, and some of my philosophies too. I'm always adding to it. I just had a rebuild. And so I'm still kind of rebuilding with more stuff in that direction, um, more pages of my content and work, but you can find my books through there and, um, and then reach out and say hello. Perfect. I appreciate it. Thanks for calling in today, Annie. Mm, it's my pleasure, Todd. It was a Have pleasure. a beautiful day. You mm -hmm. too. Bye-bye. there you have it my interview with Annie Jubb I hope you got as much information from this as I did it was quite informative anyways if you're interested in asking Annie a question why don't you email it to me at questwithtodd at gmail.com or you can leave a voice message at anchor.fm forward slash metatomics and I'll have Annie answer your question on a future podcast. Hope you enjoyed this today. We'll be back again next week. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to Quest. Please be sure and rate and review this podcast. This podcast is copyright. Any previously trademarked or copyright content is used by permission. Be sure to visit the official website for the International Association of Metatomics at metatomics.org or find us on social media for other unique content. And make sure to pick up a copy of the book that started a spiritual revolution, Metatomics, The Grand Design, available for sale online and at most major bookstores. Thanks for listening.